right hand side with the cameras ready. Here comes Mark Levy in P51 Jersey Joe. Probably around 300 as he dived in from the from the east, getting his much, much smash on as he can chat. We can chat. We don't talk about Max Chat, James. What do you think they're talking about? Max Chat. You ever heard the term Max Chat? I never have. When you talk about full power, it's Max Chat. Cylinder head air temperature. That's where that term comes from. Huh. Well, what do you know? But it's great to see so many people still here, isn't it? It is fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Mark's had a busy day. He actually opened the programme this morning, flying this very P-51 on the wing of the... Uh, with the F-35. Or on the wing of the, Thunder, the P-47 with the F-35. They were flying Spitfires, then Thunderbolts, finally Mustangs. And as soon as Blakesley saw the world empowered, that Air Force, which was going to be the tactical Air Force, a ground support Air Force. But Blakesley went and lobbied said, I can turn this around in 24 hours. I can have our pilots ready. Jimmy Doolittle, who was in command of the 8th Air Force by the beginning of 1944, rather doubted that, but conceded the point. And they switched over, literally, in 24 hours. <laughs> Don Blakesley for one never regretted it. He left his aircraft with a... His love would have been very deep indeed. And I can kind of see why. It's an amazing shape, an amazing design. It's small and light and like a little angry wasp. And it has this incredible range. 35,000 feet can fly over 455 miles an hour. It's faster than anything, it was 70 miles an hour faster than anything the Germans had above 28,000 feet. I said to them. <laughs> in, in comparison to a measure spit and a Spitfire, it's actually an ergonomic wonder. If you look at the, the boxy shape of those bouchons on the line there, and they, even the very cramped cockpit of the Hurricane and Spitfire, the, the P-51 was but sitting in an armchair, it's just got so much room in the cockpit, everything seems to be in the right place, where you look, everything, all the instruments are in the right place. So an um, ergonomic wonder in comparison to some of those early Second World War single-seat fighters. Yeah, and his fuel efficiency is second to none, which is why it made such a good long-range fighter. For a 75-gallon tank behind the pilot, he uses the size of tanks and the water the back if they needed to. known as the Mustang scream, that sort of whistling noise, which is the air flowing over the gun ports. So imagine blowing over the top of a beer bottle and you get that whistling noise. Same effect when you're when you hear that Mustang scream and another pub fact for you. Some of the, the R2D2 sound effects in Star Wars were actually 
the Mustang Scream. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, the things I've learned from you today, Lingy, it's amazing. But the four fighter group, I'm picking out them, but it, I could have picked out the 56 or 354 for any number of them. But I think the key point about them is that they, they fulfill the, the three M's. Method, motivation and morale. They had a great plane, they knew what they were doing, motivation was good, they understood the mission, morale was extremely high because they were all incredibly good at what they did. And Don Blakesley as a fighter commander was just superb, tough, no nonsense, hard drinking, square jawed, good looking, and kind of fostered really strong sense of high morale, self-confidence, but not complacency. There was no question that these guys knew that fighter, flying fighter planes was a hard job, a difficult job, dangerous job, but there was confidence in their ability and a desire to constantly get better. And the P-51, they had a plane that enabled them to, to do all that. Wide undercarriage, easiest land on a lot, robust, highly maneuverable, fast, and incredibly jokes. Was there ever a plan to get in naval last? I don't think so. You know, the naval planes were doing very nicely, thank you, without having to convert um, non naval planes. This is an absolutely lovely display, isn't it? Really, putting it for its places. I know for a fact he's having a lot of fun in there. He's a very amazing aeroplane to get the controls over. And this guy to himself. How could he not? You know, and I just can't stress enough but by the sort of Second half of 1943, you've got the bomber crews absolutely struggling, being decimated. Odds stacked against you getting through your 25 missions in a bomber. The contrast with the fighter groups could not have been greater. Where they had good planes, even before the P-51 came out, nothing wrong with the P-47 as we saw earlier on. And they were given the proper training. And of course, over in the United States, you can train very quickly, which means you can process more people. The intensity of training is better, so it's not spread out. No problems with bad weather or anything like that, you know, down in Florida and Texas and so on. Plenty of sunshine all year round in which you can fly and learn to fly. Build up your hours, get over to Britain, 350 hours in the logbook. You know, that's a decent amount. Then make the transition from trainee pilots to combat worthy fighter pilots. It's a difference. Because it's a bit like driving a car, after a while you don't think about switching the indicator or slipping it into what gear or whatever, you just do it. It's, a, it's sort of muscle memory, it's on automatic. And really, as a fighter pilot, that's the situation you want to be with flying the plane. You don't have to think about flying the plane, you just want to do it, which means you can then concentrate on the difficult role of actually being a fighter pilot, a combat pilot. <laughs> 